everybody. I'm here in my hotel room in Berlin, Germany. I just got done giving a talk at Ableton for a music conference they hold called Loop. It's this really exciting conference where there's a bunch of talks and sound installations and performances. <laughs> And I gave a talk on something that is very near and dear to my heart, polyrhythms. New Horizons in Music, Polyrhythms with Adam Neely. There'll be a QA session after that, so get your pen and paper and your questions ready. We'll see you at 12.30. We need to use math. <laughs> to circle every X numbers. In this case, X is two. So we're gonna go left to right, left to right, in order, kind of like how we would read. That specific talk has a lot to do with some of the things that I talk about all the time on this channel. So I might post some of that stuff later. And until I do that, let's do a Q and A. Moon Turkey writes, Hey Adam, if you're going to give someone a long, long plan from squarish one on how to make something huge like this, what would you say? I'm thinking in regards to musical knowledge, arranging, organizing, musicians, etc. I want to see the years of skill and knowledge that go into a project like this. Smiley face. So in my personal experience, doing something like the apartment sessions is much more about your ability to organize and do your homework and be prepared and be able to take control of logistics rather than your ability to write good music or play good music. Playing and writing good music should almost be a default. It should be assumed that you can write something really cool or orchestrate something really cool and you know have people who can play that. But making sure it goes off well is very important. And you know, the people that do apartment sessions really put in the time to know all of the details necessary in order to execute it. For example, when I got the sheet music for the song that we were going to record, it was here. They prepared all of the page turns so that the person to the left of me would do the page turn so I didn't have to stop playing bass. It says actually on the part, Sarah turns page because they organized it so they knew exactly where everybody was going to be in the apartment so that they could turn each other's page. I absolutely love that level of detail because it shows that they are absolutely committed to making this crazy thing a reality. And you know, knowing these sorts of details usually just comes from doing it a lot because you'll run into situations where you will waste time because some detail wasn't taken care of. Like maybe there was an accidental that was left off of a part and that is a good five minutes of trying to figure out like which note goes here. And that's, you know, that's time wasted. The amount of time and attention to detail that's necessary for these things is pretty incredible and so the more that you really do your homework ahead of time the better a product you're going to get you know I've said before on these Q&A's that you should never get hung up on the details but not getting hung up on the details doesn't mean ignoring the details the more details that are included the better it's just you don't want to spend too much time on any one thing basically the more attention to detail the better Corda 1993 writes did jam of the week make your new intro yeah the guy who did the animation for my new intro is a guy by the name of Simon Fransman and the guy is a jazz meme genius. You should definitely check out his page. Link is in the description. And he posts all the time at Jam of the Week on Facebook, which is a very popular Facebook group where people post different like versions of different jazz standards and his jazz standards are often quite uh, unique shall we say. Definitely check out Simon Fransman, he's awesome. Tyler Stiegel writes, Here's my question. I'm at a point in my banjo playing where I feel like I've hit a creative plateau. As I continue to study the styles and sounds of the greats like Earl Scruggs or Bela Fleck, I'm struggling to translate what I learned into writing original music or improvising. How can I start using the knowledge I'm getting from studying the playing of others and apply that towards my first steps into improvisation and creating original music? So yeah, that whole process of taking something that you really are inspired by and then translating that into something original, something that you can call your own is kind of mercurial, it's kind of shrouded in mystery for a lot of people and myself included to a certain point. The one thing I'll say is that you kind of have to have faith in this process. You have to have faith that by learning a lot of different things you'll be able to do something original eventually. Even if you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel right now, you will eventually be able to do that because that's how everybody essentially learned. They found something that they really liked, they really got into it, they studied it for a very long time, and then eventually they were able to say something in their own 
own voice. When you learn something and when you're studying something, what you're trying to do, what you're attempting to do, is you're trying to develop a vocabulary of licks, tricks, harmonies, chords, melodies, all sorts of things that are in the source material and you're trying to learn as much of that as you can. And the thing I, I'd like to think about is the bigger a vocabulary you have, the more things you will be able to say. So keep that in mind. Learn as much as you can, keep adding to your bag of tricks, and eventually you have faith in the process, you will be able to say something original that feels good for you. Zachary Shirley writes, Hey Adam, I doubt you're going to read this, but I have a question that I haven't found anywhere. Why do different cultures use different types of harmonies? For example, Appalachian harmony is very different from the typical harmony found in Indian music. Sorry if this is a stupid question, just curious. Thanks, Adam. So whenever you listen to any song that has any kind of harmony in it, doesn't matter what kinds of chords, just harmony in general, it's going to owe pretty much all of that aspect, the harmonic aspect, to the Euro European classical music traditions of the past thousand years. Because European art music is really the only style of music or tradition of music across the world that has been obsessed with the idea of polyphony, having multiple melodies occurring at the same time. And whenever you have multiple melodies occurring at the same time, you really have to be cognizant of the vertical arrangement of intervals so that at any one moment in these multiple melodies, it doesn't sound bad. You want to make sure that all of the intervals in any given vertical moment sound good with one another, and that sort of has been the genesis of harmony. This preoccupation with the vertical nature of music has not occurred in other cultures, at least to the same degree as it has in European music. However, that does not mean that other cultures haven't developed music as much as Europe has, because in North Indian and also South Indian music, you have a much much, much more subtle and much more refined idea of melody and much more complicated idea of rhythm than you would ever see in any sort of European classical music until maybe the past 50 years. So whenever you hear harmony in a different style of music that's not European classical music, and there are a lot of other styles of music besides European classical music that use harmony, it's such a broad term, it's because those cultures adopted the idea of harmony and then turned the whole thing into something new and exciting. Now when you take the music from the Appalachian Mountains of the East Coast of the United States and compare that to Indian music, I find that a really interesting comparison because the harmony in Appalachian music is very based in the European classical tradition, very simple diatonic chords, lots of ones, fours, and fives, all that good stuff. That sort of stuff doesn't really exist in classical Indian music. However, Appalachian music borrows very heavily from Scottish and Irish traditional music, especially in the style of Appalachian music known as old time music. And traditional Scottish and Irish music is very melodically based and also drone based, like with bagpipes and other sorts of instruments. And that is very much the same thing in Hindustani music and also Carnatic music in India, where you have drones and also a very rhythmically active, melodic conception of music. And I find those comparisons really interesting because Harmony is not always going to be the main generator of musical interest. You sometimes have to look at other aspects of the music to draw comparisons and see how different styles, even though if they might sound a little bit different on the surface, actually can be very connected. Titan Killer 37 writes, Hi Adam, how would you engineer a live bass synth sound with just a bass and stomp boxes? So it helps to know a little bit about synthesizers and how to create sounds on synthesizers if you're trying to get synth tones on bass guitar. Because when you try and get synth tones on bass guitar, what you're trying to do is emulate specific elements from a regular synthesizer. And the first and most important thing is to try and emulate the sound of an oscillator. Now the waveforms that we usually try and emulate are sawtooth waveforms and square waveforms because those sounds are very harmonically rich. There's a lot of higher end information and overtones that we can use to later manipulate the signal. Now the way that we can achieve this sort of sawtooth or square waveform is with a fuzz pedal. And most people when they're trying to get synth tones on bass guitar use something called a gated fuzz. Most synthesizers allow you to adjust the release of a note so that when you release the tone, nothing occurs afterwards. When you're playing bass guitar or regular guitar with a high gain fuzz pedal or a distortion pedal, releasing the note causes there to be a lot of extra noise that has to sort of dissipate before there is complete silence. Having a gated fuzz will cut off the end of the note and that gives a little bit more of a synthy feeling when you're playing so you can play more staccato with a very harmonically rich tone. Most synths also have a filter which lets you shape the sound of a sawtooth waveform or a square waveform, bringing in harmonic information and taking it out to create sort of wow or 
pew sounds. You can get the wow or pew sounds on bass guitar with a filter pedal. So you would have a gated fuzz, a filter pedal, and then optionally before everything, I sometimes use an octave pedal. Octave pedals are optional, but they definitely give a certain beef and girth to the sound that you wouldn't normally have. There's so many other things that you can do with synthesizers to emulate those sounds on bass guitar, but it really just comes down to knowing more about creating sounds in the electronic world of synthesizers. So, good luck. Daniel Yahalom writes, I literally cannot believe that there was almost nothing with the excruciating work of public relations and bureaucracy, not to mention working on another job. Here in Israel, it's near impossible to be a young musician without a side job. I met musicians waiting tables, cooking for weddings, writing programs and whatnot, but it is relevant that you teach. I think that I never met a musician in Israel with a degree that didn't teach this way or another to make a living. So I have touched on all of these things in a video called How to Make a Million Dollars as a Performing Musician. And the punchline is, Start with two million, but don't shh. But honestly, in this video, I go through many of the different avenues that performing musicians can take in order to make a living, including having a side job, or teaching, or working as a side man or woman. There's many different ways that you can do this. Now, in that video, A Week in the Life of a Musician in New York City, that was literally just my week that week. I decided I wanted to start vlogging a little bit more, so I just took my phone and started filming a couple of the things that I was doing. I played like three weddings, I did a bunch of gigs, I taught you know, the general musician grind. I'm not always gonna be filming like me sitting on the subway for an hour or me writing emails or logistics or, you know, I didn't have another job at the time, so why would I film that? Know that when you're watching a vlog, it's not always going to be all encompassing for all of humanity. You're just watching one person and what they do. And I feel like I did a pretty decent job showing that it was possible and I was doing it to make a living as a performer and teacher in New York. If you personally want to tell a story about the bureaucracy that you're dealing with, or the public relations that you deal with, or the things that I didn't mention in my particular video, I encourage you to do that, or any other musician to do that, because storytelling through vlogging can be very, very powerful, but I just chose not to do it that particular week. Anyway guys, this has been a short q and I'm sorry that I can't stay longer, I have to get back to loop. So uh, yeah, cue uh, exit cards.